Have you ever wondered how successful architecture, engineering, and construction companies scale their business? Or have you ever wanted guidance on how to get more growth, wealth, and freedom from your AEC company? Well, then you are in luck. Hi, I'm Will Forat. And I'm Justin Nagel, and we're your podcast hosts. We interview successful AEC business leaders to learn how they use people, process, and technology to scale their businesses. So sit back and get ready to learn from the industry's best. This is Building Building Scale. Hey listeners, it's Will here. Our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. If you've ever listened to our show, then you know that the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. So if you suspect technology is your weak link, then book a call with us to see where we can help maximize your company's IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. Today's guest is the CEO of Eastman Cook and Associates, Peter Morandi. Eastman Cook is a full-service turnkey general contracting and construction management firm with expertise in ground-up and renovations, corporate interiors, nonprofit facilities, specialty retail, academic institutions, hospitals, laboratories, and much more. Peter comes from a long line of contractors, so at a young age, he knew construction would be his life's work. Growing up just outside of Boston, he watched his father, grandfather, uncles, and cousins build their business by managing workers' personalities, keeping the equipment running, and living up to clients' expectations. Peter studied construction management and engineering at Roger Williams University and headed south to New York shortly after graduation. After 10 years as a construction manager, director of operations, and chief operating officer for a leading New York City contractor, Peter started Eastman Cook in 2009. Taking great pride in his team and projects, Peter runs the company with a focus on collaboration, innovation, safety, and reliability. He believes in asking clients the right questions, creating solutions, and delivering projects without surprises. With all that said, Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, we're excited to have you because uh, you are uh, very smart and you're investing in technology in ways that we do not see very often in uh, the construction space. Uh, so we're we're really excited to to get into that. But before we do, tell us the origin story. So Boston and New York, those are those are harsh harsh uh, moving climates, I would say. Uh, so tell yeah. us a little bit about that, and tell us about the the grandfather, father, cousins, uncles, all in the construction industry. Yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun growing up in Boston. Uh, having my whole family there was great. Being surrounded by construction my entire life, it's, it's just been great. Climbing up machines, digging holes, um, watching all my family members talk about whose truck was bigger and badder and shinier, and uh, hanging out at the coffee shop with my uh, my old man and uncles, cousins, all that kind of stuff. So everyone's still in the business. I was the one who decided to break away and and come down to New York. Um, A funny story, we were at the we were at the coffee shop one time and all the guys were were doing their thing that they do talking about construction. And I was I got only probably seven, eight years old, I think at the time. And uh, one of my uncles came up and tussled my hair a little bit and said, so what are you going to be when you grow up? And I looked up and I said to him, I'm going to be a dentist. And they were all so happy. <laughs> oh, Roger, you finally got one of them out of the business. This is going to be great. You know, you, you, he's got a whole new life ahead of him out of, out of this world. And fast forward, guess what? And right in the thick of it. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Although it does feel some days like I'm getting a root canal. Um, I do. I do love this. Uh, I do love this business. And, uh, you know, I really have some questions for you guys first that I have to that I have to start with. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> you know, spot migration um love your website love what you guys do um love learning a lot about how um how you're running your business but will got this title of of president and justin got this title of chief storyteller and i mean this was was like a wrestling match between you guys who got somebody who had to act corporate and someone who got to be playful what What's the origin of that? Well, Peter, you've you've dealt with us now uh, a few times, so I think that a little bit of our personalities kind of go to those things, uh, and maybe you can attest to that for the listeners. 
but I am generally uh, the more playful one, I guess you could say in, in the nicest way. It, it's also uh, very true to what I do, right? So like I'm, I'm very much a storyteller kind of across the board. Um, that's marketing, if that's culture, if that's podcast, obviously, uh, there's a lot of that. So that that was the case. And I, I came around after after Will. Will was already leading the, leading the charge. So that's a little bit of that, that too. Oh, so I'd like these fireside chats about uh, IT and technology, cybersecurity. That, that that kind of thing is uh is 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 your part of it yeah I mean, it's, it's it's all about uh how, how you take this thing that's super complicated super boring a lot of times how do you make that a little bit more flavorful right? you have to tell stories you have to have real experience to it uh and then attach it to analogies that just make sense right like otherwise it's like you're you know talking about stuff that nobody sees and you talk about like an infrastructure for a company it's like uh it's like air, like nobody actually sees any of it. You see the productivity, the outcome, the result, but you don't actually see, oh yeah, like having the right, uh, you know, networking equipment in place really does change your company so dramatically. It's just like, that's that's hard to believe uh, from an outsider until you actually see the outcome and you can showcase those outcomes better with story. And I'm the one that uh, is a little quieter. And then when I ask a question, usually people stop. So, and actually think a little bit. Um, uh, sometimes I point out the obvious, sometimes I point out the not so obvious. I've got about a thousand ideas an hour and only one of those a day might actually be good. So, <laughs> um, and so people shoot me off in the corner and tell me not to be in operations. I, I guess that's kind of part of the running joke. Um, and so, uh, what I do is how I, I help educate. Right. And so uh, a big part of my job is to help people understand why do companies spend more on technology, how to spend more, why to spend more even on cybersecurity, for example. And uh, people don't understand to what degree it helps their operations. They don't understand, at least smaller companies. And when I say smaller, I mean sub hmm, smaller. I guess that's relative. Even half billion dollar companies don't know necessarily how to spend or how to justify costs because they look at it as a cost, not as a value. They don't understand leverage. Uh, the entire industry, uh, and when I say industry, I'm talking about like the built world industry, is 10 to 30 years behind the rest of the world. Why is it that big companies, let's say companies like Amazon, spend thousands of dollars per person per year and then the construction industry spends hundreds. It's not because Amazon is overspending. It's because the industry is underspending. Construction costs and efficiencies have only gone up. So construction efficiencies have only gone up about 10%, whereas the rest of the world has gone up about 700%. I wouldn't that's... even think it would be. I wouldn't even think it would be ten percent. So that's, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty good statistic. You know, yeah. I, I say all the time. You know, people ask me about technology and and how we're advancing this and that. And I said, well, at the end of the day, we still just put bricks on top of bricks. Mm -hmm. so, you know, trying to improve on something that's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> it's, um, you know, there's always a challenge, but we figure out you know ways to do it. Um, I, I really, I, I do. I got to throw you guys some kudos about uh, this, this idea you have about making technology reliable. Um, you know, we're following the same type of, of mantra um, when we're, when we're doing our projects, you know, we, we're, what we're trying to do is let a client do what they do best and let us just let us do the construction, just, just hand it over this way. And I, I think that you guys are probably uh, doing the same thing in, in, in your world. Do what you do best and outsource the rest. That's yeah. that's the term that we use. <laughs> yeah. And I do have to also say one other thing. I am completely jealous that you guys look like air traffic controllers. And 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 I <laughs> I don't get to, you know, wear this great I I felt like I had I was gonna buy one, just just not even use it, just put it on just for fun. And but then I figured if I did that, I couldn't even hear what you guys were saying. But these are so comfortable. I I wear these all day. I can wear these for 12 hours a day and not an issue. Ears don't get sweaty. So I know we're going like totally different direction uh, in this podcast. So sorry, listeners, if this is not what you want to hear. Um, 
but this is not just a, how it goes sometimes. Not at all. But you guys remember how we started when we were first talking. Um, you guys made a reference to the Matrix, and you guys were dying laughing about it. Like totally, <laughs> just, I've never watched the whole Matrix. Uh, and, you know, just so you guys were making this reference, I was laughing to myself, like nodding this fake little smile that I had on about the Matrix. And I was thinking about, you know, Keanu Reeves out on a job site, just sitting there. Don't let the concrete go below 65 degrees. We can't. It's going <laughs> to fail on us. Oh. A nice speed reference. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I really I really wanted to see him out of my on one of my uh, one of my job sites one time, but hasn't 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 happened yet. So well, now I, I'll know what to to get you for your birthday a copy of the original Matrix so you can uh, you can watch I, that. I probably, uh, I probably still won't watch it, but that's okay. I, I you probably because you don't have a DVD player, a Blu-ray player uh, readily available. I don't. I, I don't have one. Like I, I only stream movies. That's the only way I know how to at this point. Yeah. But nonetheless, let's talk about investing in technology. Uh, you you kind of teed this up a little bit upon what we do in our background, and we appreciate that certainly. But uh, what about you? Like, what are you doing? When you look at technology, because you see it a little bit differently than the standard of the industry, for sure. Yeah. So you you mentioned a really good word, um, which we use a lot. We kick it around a lot, which is leverage. And uh, it's part of our business, part of our, you know, the very fabric that, that we're part, you know, involved in. And it's not just leverage over a client or a client having leverage over us. It's leveraging the industry and what's out there right now. Um, and as I alluded to before, putting technology into construction is not the easiest thing in the world. There are great programs that can help you schedule better or manage the process a little bit better. Some of the technology that we're looking at now is taking that to the next level. We've been doing some testing out on our sites right now where we're able to measure things, not necessarily that are production-based, which you, you would think that that would be really important because we we are an um, uh, uh, industry that definitely could improve in uh, our way of doing the things that we do and our efficiencies as we do it. Um, but these are the kind of things that where we're looking at safety and we're looking at um, the ability to monitor a job site in a different way. So that some of the technology that we've been working with just measures everything that could possibly go on a job, whether it, it measures sound, light, airborne contaminants, um, cries for help, uh, you know, anything that is almost outside of the realm of, of, like I said before, putting the bricks on top of the bricks to make sure our workers are safe, to make sure everyone goes home at the end of the night, but also to take a look at how we're operating on a day-to-day -day basis. So we may pick up something um, with one of the detectors that we have that says that someone is is working in a way where we have, say, so someone did a boneheaded move, like start a generator inside a building. Well, every time we get um, one of these um, notifications, what happens is it triggers something. In this case, it may trigger a camera, it may trigger a, a strobe light, a warning, a fire alarm, things like that. And integrating that into the job sites. So the byproduct of it ends up uh, site being safer or, or we're even looking at this like, wait a minute, we weren't even thinking about this, but it becomes more efficient. And one of the parts that we're integrating is AI to do things like facial recognition, um, to do things like how much material is coming in on job site, um, being able to measure some of that productivity that's out there. So, I mean, this is really at its uh, infancy, but there is so much that we can do. We can get so much uh, broader than it is right now. Um, and it's it's taking us and saying, wait a minute, we still have to do some of the age old things that we do, but how can we just, how do we dial in that knob a little bit and make it even even better? So this is kind of a cross between construction, safety, and developer logic. This is the if this, then that type of logic, right? So if this okay. triggers, <laughs> then do this thing, right? Is right. that okay? That's, so, that's exactly what happens. Um, and you're saying it's in the inf uh, infancy because you essentially have created an infinite number of conf combinations, sensors, right? Uh, and what that output or what that 
trigger versus what that thing can happen to be able to increase safety. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, there are some versions uh, or some combinations that you found that are probably more prevalent uh, just from, from your own, um, we'll call it from your own innovation and from your own researching. Uh, are you able to share a little bit about uh, some examples, uh, let's say like the high VOC uh, example? Right. Yeah. So we have one of the detectors pick up um, high VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds, um, things that are flammable. And what we found out was that we had a worker that was uh, without ventilation, uh, without the proper precautions, uh, personal protective gear, putting down a high volatile organic, high VOC material that could have started a fire if someone had a spark. It also picked up someone vaping right near them, which does have a heating coil in it. Um, it. It took the guesswork out of someone having to walk around the building and see this. It picked up in a second and we shut it down right away. Um, and it was able, this is not punitive. This is not the kind of thing that we're looking to go and uh, get someone in trouble for doing this. We're looking to say, wait a minute, are you doing the right thing at the at the right time with the right precautions that were there. And, and in an instant, we were able to just shut it down and stop it and get the right product out there, get the right precautions out there, um, you do some ventilation, make sure there weren't other people working nearby, make sure someone wasn't vaping right there or smoking right right near uh, where they were working. And that's just a just a small example of something that this uh, that technology will will pick up for us. And be able to help us to to manage. I mean, this is really great uh, and innovative. This is this is really preventing accidents, right? Safety, shared responsibility. But not everyone knows everything, or not everyone remembers everything. You have a bad day, or you just didn't get your morning coffee. We were just talking about this earlier, <laughs> and accidents happen, right? And but those accidents can turn into or if you call it not thinking, right? I'm sure there's some more harsh words that are used on the on the construction site, um, where that stupid little thing, what was little, could have turned into something much okay. bigger, a, yeah. or a, potentially either someone's life completely in danger, or you know, or loss, right? Could have been someone's hands blown off, or limb. It, it could be a number of things that that could have happened in that situation. So prevention um, as a cost, you know, uh, how do you treat, how do you make sure, or excuse me, from a cost perspective, what is enough, what is not enough in terms of, in terms of safety? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because what we are, what we're trying to measure and we're working with the insurance companies to figure out what the best bang for the buck is. So, as I said before, this is not something that's punitive. This is something um, that's a reminder of what the right thing to do is, what the safe thing to do is. And I can't put a dollar amount on that or even a percentage amount because if it doesn't happen, we never know what the cost was. So even just putting in measures like this, which is minuscule compared to what a construction claim is worth, um, or when someone's life is is altered dramatically because there's an accident on a on a job site, uh, that's that's where the real um, savings is in this uh, in this scenario is being able to know that someone went home safe or that they were just reminded on a con. So part of like one of the um, one of the features that we can add into this is uh, is a is a laser grid. Um, so if someone was to work from height, for instance, if they got above that height, it would remind them, are you tied in? Are you um, breaking that plane that's that's happening in, on, on a ladder or on scaffold or all the pieces that are supposed to be there as protective equipment in place? So it's it's not that we're going and saying, wait a minute, you did the wrong thing. You need to you already broke the the, the, the rule or you already got injured. And now what do we do about it? We're saying, hey, wait a minute, let's change the way we're thinking about this. And that's really what we're working towards is um, 
changed thought process of so what I call this is the uh, the fluorescent shirt phenomenon. So for years and years and years, we were always trying to get guys into fluorescent shirts because uh, day glow um, safety colors are really important on a, on a job site. And it just wasn't happening. Then all of a sudden, everyone started wearing these bright orange and, and bright yellow shirts. And now you were part of the club. You know, it gave you a sense of identity. Everybody knew when you were sitting on the train or you, when you were um, coming by, walking down the street, it was only a little badge of honor. Like, yeah, I'm a construction worker. That's right. You know, I'm like, you wouldn't wear the shirt, but I will. And so we changed the culture. You know, we, we were able to, over time, get this to where everyone was, was, was part of the club. And it wasn't forcing anyone to go and have to wear personal protective gear, it was a, a matter of them belonging to this uh, this group that was going to do it regardless, because it's cool, not just because it's uh, it was a, a safety feature that was required by, uh, by OSHA or by company policy. So it's the same sort of thing, is that we're, we're using this technology to not make this be a burden, but just to say, oh yeah, you know what, I, I, you're right, I really do want to go home at the end of the day. And I, re I really do remember that if I'm working in this capacity, that I need to be doing it a little bit differently than maybe I, I thought that I could get away with it. Yeah, it's um, also sending a message to all all your people saying, like, we care. We care Absolutely. that we're going to invest in this thing. Like, you know, like we're going <clears> to <throat> actually put our money where our mouth is and not say, like, yeah, we ran you through the toolbox time that we, everybody else did that we just, you know kind of slap you know slap together kind of thing. it's like no like we are definitively putting putting things in place that are not just the the minimum the par like we're doing more than that because we care about you uh, i think that that sends a huge message uh for culture just in general you know it's, it's part of our vision statement is that uh you know we value our people and and we act as one team um we really look to hire the best and the brightest in the in the business, um, hire them for character, hire them for their values, and then teach them the ECA way. And that's not just with our staff, but with the subcontractor ba base that we use or the material suppliers. Um, and it does send a message, but also it sends, um, it puts out there that we're looking ahead we're not looking just to do things the way they've always been done. We're looking to say, this is the way that this is going to continue for the future. Because it's going to. It, it's just inevitable. Um, building is never going to stop. We're always going to have to be, I, I go back to my my caveman and, um, and saber-toothed tiger story that at some point someone learned how to build a fence to keep the saber-toothed tiger out of their, uh, you know, out of their cave. And it evolved from there and it has, it's going to keep evolving because we're always going to need a place to live or work or um, recreate in. So there's always going to be that piece of the world that in, includes construction. So why not make it a little bit better? Why not make it a little bit easier? Why not make it um, a little more efficient, a little safer incrementally? That That's the way it's going to happen. It also goes to uh, using sensors and tools like this over time, you're able to see patterns, you know, obviously safety patterns, but also right. like production patterns. It's like, oh, like, uh, like one, one example that I've heard is like, yeah, how you set up like your, your workstation or, you know, the places you work, where your tools are sitting. Like if you have to walk across the yard for something like that's, those are production boxes. It's like, and again, and when you look at it in a one individual instance, it's like, well, that's not that much. But when you think of that one individual action that happens 25 times a day on how many sites and how many guys, and like now it starts saying like, oh yeah, like there is total, you know, a, a soft cost loss here that we're not seeing. It's not a dollar amount that's disappearing necessarily. It's a production amount that's disappearing over time. So having sensors like this should help you be more strategic in those decisions, not necessarily the big brother aspect. It's more of like, how do we just make better decisions? Right. And even that, you know, integrating AI in that um, and, and just teaching what we're monitoring with more and more and more data, just collecting all of this stuff is just making making us smarter and making the model smarter. 
Um, and it's the kind of thing that you're absolutely right is that it does end up help looking at production and looking at um, the way things are being done repetitively and then trying to make those changes out in the field by having awareness. You know, like, look, if you had moved this over to the left hand side of the of the site, it, it would have made you more productive. We did, we did just that. To use your example, we watched someone over the last three months walk a thousand times back and forth to, to go get material somewhere and multiply that by, you know, it took them an extra two minutes by all those days, by all those weeks, by all those hours. It definitely makes a difference. Yeah, I anytime I built, I just uh, I just built a, a toy Jeep, uh, as in like a drivable Jeep for my son, and it took me forever to do, mostly because I'm not that handy, but two because like I never have anything in the right spot. It's like I'll put a tool <laughs> down, I'll go to the other side, and I'm like shit, I need that tool again. I gotta go back over here. Like I see it in the small scale. I'm like this is so inefficient. I'm so bad at this, and I can tell that I'm bad at it, but I don't do it enough to say like. I need to be better at this, but I, I can only imagine building a, a building like, oh, it, it would take me, even if I had the knowledge to do it, it would take me like, you know, six additional months to, or maybe six years. I don't know to be able to do this just simply based on the poor like process that I have and like setup that I have. I just, I can, I totally could see that. Yeah. And I mean, you know, our, our clients are loving it. I love, you know, they're going to love that. Um, they're getting a job that's more efficient, uh, that keeps them on schedule. Right back to my mantra of let them do their business and leave the construction to us. They they want to get into their space. They want to go and sell cars or do surgeries or have their office ready up and going. And if we can make that a little bit more efficient or make it um, have less of a punch list or give the efficiencies even right back to our subcontractor base. It's a win for us as well. Wow, you know we love work for Eastman Cook because they they've got great job sites and we can get in and we can get out and um, it, you know be more efficient and, and that means that maybe we on the next job get some better pricing than than someone else does. This really builds on top of each other and it's a win 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 really for client contractor subcontractor. It all come you know comes together and at the end of the day. Why not do this? It, it only makes sense. What are some other uh, ways that Eastman delivers that high level of client experience? I know that multiple times have been said, like, how do you meet their expectations and or how do you exceed their expectations? How do you get them in their building as soon as possible? Like all these things. How, what are what are ways that you're being able to accomplish that? Obviously, the tech what we just talked about. But what are other things that you're doing that are, are driving that happiness factor? Yeah, we, we worked with the um, the Fails Management Institute, FMI. They're one of the largest consultants of the construction and uh, investment banking world. And they, you know, we thought we were buying like this this canned program that, you know, they just come in and you just plug in a couple of things and it works. And instead, what it was was a, um, a year long of really hard work with them. And just to develop some core processes, we call them our six tenants. And it's a start and a finish really strong with a few check-ins in between. So before we even step on a site, before we even get started, we do a pre-job planning session that lasts a number of days. Um, sometimes we just don't have all the information. So then we've got to jump back once we can fill in all the blanks that we need to fill in. This is things like, where are we going to set up? How are we going to mobilize? Do we have permits? What are the terms of the contract? Do we have all the subcontractors bought out? Do they understand all of our safety protocols? Do we have the right insurance in place? All the things that you want to make sure are done well before you step foot on the on the on the job site. And it's it's just the preparation before we get to the the starting line. And then once that gun goes off, um we're we're ready to go, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, and and sometimes it even means having to take a deep breath and, and saying, okay, I know I know when you want to start, but let us get this set up right. Give us an extra week to do it, and then we'll we'll start this because the end date's the end date. We'll we'll still get there. We'll still meet it, but let's let's get this thing kicked off right. Um, our teams are all required to give us a stand and deliver, which really says, yeah, we're ready. We went through it. We did the pre-job planning. We talked to the client. We've got everything set up. Sure, you're good. We're good. Okay, let's go. And then 
it's not like this free for all that just happens and you're just really hoping that oh this thing is going to get done and this project's going to get built by the end of the uh the end of the year and we check in with our teams uh third of the way through the project two thirds of the way through the project we're looking at them to come and say okay here's what's working uh here is what the rocks in the roads are how do you get around them how's the client feeling you know what what do they think about this we're on schedule we're on budget we're 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 close to it what do we need to, what modify a bit and this is the time where we can go in and still make a change when when we're looking at a project life cycle it's it's, it's interesting if if you look at the number of people that are involved in a project from the start to the finish when we're starting a project when we're working with an architect engineer um, owner's representative, there's only a few people involved, maybe a, maybe a couple on the architecture side, a couple or a few on the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, engineering side, um, a contractor, you know, maybe a, a project executive, a project manager, estimator. It, it's, it's a dozen people. It's, it's, you know, under 20 people that are working on this. If we resolve a, a problem at that stage, the cost of those 20 people is pretty small compared to when we're running a job and we've got 150 or 200 craft workers on site who then can't do anything because we're trying to address the problem then. So it's a 10x cost if we do it later in the project, when we're working, when we've already started, than if we figure things out early on. And that mentality, thinking about that, going, wait a minute, let's start down at the base level and keep all the smartest people in the room solving things out so then we can hand them out to the smartest people in the field to, to go and build it rather than having a bunch of people sitting around with their hands in their pockets because it wasn't resolved what, earlier. So that that startup process is is so important to make sure that everything is is ready to go. Checking in and seeing if it's actually working a third of the way, two thirds of the way along doesn't leave any room for not being able to make changes in a, in a positive way. And once we get close to the end, we know we have to finish strong. Like that's really when our clients are looking at where we're at, are we gonna make it? Um, and we give them that information in a way that says, yes, we are. And maybe we've got a challenge over here, or maybe we've got something that we're doing well on on this side of the project. The other thing that it gives them is the opportunity to say, oh, yeah, by the way, I forgot to tell you, I need the southwest corner done first because we have some specialized equipment coming in there. And we're still flexible enough at that time to say, OK, focus the crews over there, get that area done for them, even though it's it's going to be done before the rest of the project. It gives some feedback to us. How are we going to exit the, the project really strong? Uh, you know, we're going to have the sign offs and inspections and all the things that are required that we need to go and then turn the, the project over to them. Um, and after that sigh of relief comes when we do get a project completed and uh, <laughs> a, a happy smiling client, uh, we go back and say what worked on the project, what was great, who were good subcontractors, what do we think about the client, what do we think about the process, and then really taking a deep look into is there anything we could have done better? Could we have utilized technology better? Could we have utilized our subcontractor base better? What things would our client, when we do the next job for them, like us to see um, us do? And then we take all this information and we and we dump it into an internal database that we have, and we're using it for the next time we do a similar job. We keep pricing that way. We keep production that way, schedules. We go back and look at these things and say, oh, yeah, don't forget in the last one, we missed this. Or we could have done this better. And we build that into the next project that we're doing. So there is an evolution that goes along with the 13 years that we've been in business of how we're doing things. And not just restarting and hitting, you know, like starting a new game every time. We're going back and we're we're reviewing the tapes from the previous game and the game before that and the games from five years ago and using that information to make the next job even even better. It sounds a lot like you, one, have full <clears throat> onboarding, so like a legitimate onboarding documentation, very open communication with 
both the trade partners are using, but as well as the client, and then reflective at the end to then make the next time even better than what it was this time. Is that yeah. uh, you know, yeah. summarizing that uh, fair? Very much so. Very much so. You know, we we use this concept. Um, Jim Collins has it in, uh, in Good to Great. I mean, he's one of my favorites. I just love him. Um, a great interview. Um, doesn't do it very often, but he is a really great uh, interview. And he has this he has this flywheel concept. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Oh, yeah. a, a, um, a monolith as well um, afterwards because he felt like, I mean, this is a, I just love the way this guy thinks, right? He goes, I wrote a book. It's a huge best-selling book. Um, and he tells a whole story about that, that he almost, that book almost never got published. Um, but then he goes back and rereads it and says, you know what? I didn't really describe the flywheel um, enough. So I'm going to write a little, you know, hundred pager or 70 something pager on it just to make sure I got my point across just, just for fun. <laughs> um, and, and this, you know, all this stuff has that, that same kind of effect to it. It's that same flywheel. Like if you get this thing going, like if we, if we hire the right people, um, if we create a, 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 a collaborative culture, um, if we align with the right subcontractors and the, and the right clients, um, and we get into the right markets, all of a sudden we get this thing going when we get in, increased profits, increased um, productivity, then all of a sudden we're right back up to the top where we can go and hire even more of the bright, best and brightest in the industry. We can get even better clients. We can get better subcontractors. We can work on what we love doing is, is collaborating and figuring, like I talked about the sort of the bottom of that triangle where we have the work with the architect and engineer, we can do more of that. And then when we hit the top of the triangle where, like I said, you've got 150, 200 craft workers out there, their productivity goes up because we, we, we have this thing, this momentum just to, that just starts spinning and starts going. So, um, you know, using his, um, his flywheel concept and carrying that throughout the company um, we've been, we've been doing. And all of a sudden, you know, it's fun when I'm walking in on a job site and someone's like, Oh yeah. Remember that thing you talked about the flywheel? I'm like, oh my God, you were listening. Like you were actually listening. <laughs> like I just do this to make myself sound really smart. I, I actually didn't know you guys were, you get something out of it, but, but they do. And um, you know, that, that whole thing then allows us to turn around and we set up uh, our goals for, for, for the next year. Um, look at our, what our backlog is going to be. Look at what our client mix is going to be um, and be able to, to, set some parameters around what it is that we want the company to be evolving and, and changing. Um, you know, one of the things that's great is that I have some benchmarking that I can do because I belong to uh, a peer group. So FMI, same, same uh, group mm -hmm. that I talked about, same company I talked about before. They put together, they said, I don't know, these guys are just so smart. They put together um somewhere between six and nine companies uh, across the country so we're all in the building trades we do not compete against each other uh, but we're all similar sized businesses and similar um, philosophies behind the companies and we benchmark um, in a think tank uh, two three times a year we get together and it's full open book full financials nothing gets nothing gets hidden so you can see where we are in reference to someone else and they said how did you get there or what improvements do you need in your company to get there and we have these you know six guys eight guys bouncing this off each other with a with a facilitator and we do uh you know things like um client uh, satisfaction surveys we do uh, employee sat satisfaction surveys and take all this data in and then talk about it, you know? And so we're not our own entity that doesn't use anything that's out in the industry. It's not just like writing, you know, reading a, a white paper or something like that. We're getting real live data back and real life experience back from eight other companies throughout the country and super supportive guys. Uh, it just gives, you know, I come home and <laughs> my, uh, my vice president, um, April, 
says to me, she's like, you always come up so fired up when you you come back from an FI, <laughs> FMI meeting, you know, your peer group meeting. They say, no, it's like, I have Einstein moments then. <laughs> she knows what my Einstein moments are. Um, and then we end up implementing these things. And it might be just be a small change with something, or it might be something where we say, look, this is a really big lofty goal that we have to work on for, you know, for years to come. It's, it, having that group to bounce thing off of, uh, having a group of peers to do that with is is absolutely just been um, just groundbreaking for us. I, I love, love the mastermind vibe, <laughs> uh, the concept of it, specifically when you get niche <clears throat> in where it's like, it's not just businesses. It's like, no, no, it's, we are the same essentially businesses in different locations. The value that your peers can bring you is astronomical in all kinds of different areas. It's like something you do really great. You can help somebody with somebody they're doing really great. They help you with. And like, that just, that just makes the industry better across the board. It makes each individual better, but just, you know, uh, high tides, right? All ships will, whatever the hell that analogy thing is. I, I, I can't remember that one. That's one I can never remember. <laughs> Rising tides, uh, rise, uh, all, ra- ships. Raise raise all ships. Boats. Yes. Raise all boats. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, that's that's the one. Uh, and yes, we love Jim Collins. We're an EOS company, so uh, we're very familiar with Good to Great um, and the flywheel. Uh, it is, it's true. Having having a process that gets it going, and then once it starts going, the momentum um, really carries you through. We, we've seen that for our business a whole bunch. So uh, I love it. No, and it, you don't just sound smart; you are smart because you're you're listening to smart people. That's what I always I always tell myself. If I'm listening okay. to smart people, I must be somewhat smart. You know, one of the things it does for us, it allows us to give back, which is important to us. And giving back uh, sometimes gives us uh, s- some great industry change. And one of the things we do is we work with a local community college and they have a workforce program. And we can get something on the cl- curriculum there in like one semester. If we decide that wow. there's, there's a trade that, that needs some help um, or it's lacking, we'll put together a, a curriculum with them and, and help them build the next generation of, of construction craft worker. Um, they're great. They have this giant pool of students that are just eating up education, want to get out into the field, um, want to be in, involved in the business and we're we're right there to support them and part of it really is self-serving you know we we have a, a, a labor crisis in the country going yep. on right now really in the construction industry especially so that self-serving part of it is that we're we're going we're getting uh, better trained and they, they actually are better trained fresh blood out into the field um, putting putting people to work that really are interested in, in the industry. And that's going to be the next generation that that's going to, to follow me and, and, and follow the, the people that I work with uh, because there will be craft workers that decide that they want to be superintendents or they want to be project managers or estimators. Um, and since they've been there in the field doing the work, they're just that much more valuable. And it really it feels good to, to, to be a part of that and to, and to give back um, to the to not just to the industry, but um, to the communities that surround uh, New York City. So, speaking of people, because uh, I like kind of what you said about giving back, um, you also do something unique that we have not heard another construction company talk about. Uh, it's a, and while you scaled from two people to about was it about twenty five. Uh, the reality is you are a lot larger. Uh, the The amount of people that you have is not very telling of how large you actually are because you use leverage, not from a technology, yeah, a little bit of technology, but also from a people perspective in a way that I think um, the industry has shunned or has not really learned about. Um, the idea of VAs. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Sure. Um, it, it, it was interesting how we got there. Um, I met Rob Levin at a, at a networking group, a networking meeting. He was doing something totally different. And just in conversation, mentioned the fact that he was uh, involved in a startup that had virtual assistants 
in other parts of the world, mostly Central and, and South America, that completely remotely and in a way that they're, I think they said they, they interview like 500 people to get one candidate that they can put up. So they're, they're wow. very, very selective. Yeah, we do it's, it's some crazy number like that. I'd have to go back and fact check that one. Um, but what ends up happening is that we have someone for each one of our teams, sometimes, uh, sometimes two um, virtual assistants that go and support all of the activities that they do on an administrative level. So our project managers, uh, estimating um, even the field. Um, April and I have a have our own that we uh, that we share, and it's just a great support system that's on call for the whole day that that we're there, and it it, it is different not being in the office, just having someone dedicated that can take care of those administrative things that we've been able to um, use Procore, the, the system that we use, our project management system, and say, hey, you guys, you want to learn this? Well, okay, let's do it. And next thing you know, they're, 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 they're working the, the, the Procore project management system for us. And it takes the project manager or the estimator, it, it takes those tasks that they have and it frees them up to do some things that they may even be better at. And that's just using as much leverage, to use that word again, to be able to say, you know, I have this um, this, this crazy like, expression that I use, the $1,000 an hour rule. Like if, if it's not worth $1,000 an hour, don't do it. Um, and everyone has this the same version of that all the way along along the way. And now we're finding out that we've got better follow up with our subcontractor base that we've got better information going into our um, job site requirements and into our submittals and and all of the pe all of the parts and pieces that have to happen behind the scene are running same thing like on this on this great intricate little uh like swiss watch because we've got these teams together that just they they just collaborate unbelievably. Things just happen. I don't even know about half the stuff, to be honest with you, because there's no problems with it. So it works out great. Adds to the flywheel effect, right? <clears throat> if you're getting them to do the activities that, and to your point, right? Hey, we're, we're actually following up fast. Like now, right. now the thing that is a pain in my ass, not that it's hard, it's just a pain in my ass that I, I can't do or don't want to do or have other shit that's more important to do. Now that somebody else I can put that on their plate. It actually creates the experience better for uh, the trade partners you have or a client, depending on whatever their task is. So yeah, well, you know, feedback is an important thing for us. So uh, being able to get feedback quickly, well, subcontractors bidding, not bidding. A subcontractor needs to supply um, a submittal on a certain product that they're using. The speed of that feedback has gone up greatly. And that when you have something that's a long lead item or you have a bid due date or you have a, a project completion date coming um, you know, uh, coming due, having that even incremental change is huge. It really is. goes back to the same thing that I talked about before. We could have as many craft workers as, as we want to in the field, but if we don't have the materials because they were a long lead item and they get ordered on time. It doesn't work. So you go back and you say that, you know, there's one or two people that that handled that and got it done and got it done efficiently and got it done right. Now, all of a sudden, we're out in the field and everyone keeps the production rolling. Mm -hmm. So VAs or uh, you like to call them uh, RAs. There's RAs, right. Uh, remote. Uh, remote remote assistance. assistance, right? Because they're not actually virtual, right? They actually are real people. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> Um, not in the matrix maybe this is where that comic oh, came this, from this is right this oh is... man we just came full circle uh, <laughs> Bam. Bam. so uh can you talk about um because i think there's a little bit of a there's a there's a hesitance around remote workers right if you're not in the office if you're not directly interfacing <clears throat> with people 
then they're either a not going to be as efficient or there's going to be you know more churn like you're gonna have to rehire these people constantly can you talk about your experience on what that actually looks like it, what it actually looks like is very task oriented and at the end of the day we get a report on what happened and what didn't happen that day which we don't get anywhere else. Nobody gives me a daily report on what they did that day and how efficient they were. And by the way, these, these three things didn't get done today, but I have a plan to do them tomorrow. That's part of the program. You get a report, here's what got done, here's what didn't get done. And you can pick up the phone the next morning and say, okay, let's, let's talk about what it is that uh, didn't get done yesterday. Oh, by the way, thank you for what did get done yesterday. And what needs to be done? Um, what needs to be done today? And there's just mechanisms there that uh, you know our our RA, RAs will go and do all the agendas for all of our meetings, which means that all the teams have to feed that information up to one place. And the proof in the pudding is what does that agenda look like for our 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 morning meetings that we have, our staff meeting that we may have on a Monday or Tuesday with the different departments. So it's not just buy-in on the on the um, RA side. There's buy-in on our staff side as well because they know if they don't get that information pushed up, they don't have what they need to to run or to have a, uh, a successful meeting. So there's all these nice little checks and balances that work right right up and down. That's not something that we we were getting when we even had someone working in the office. It was more you walk by, you say, "Hey, Jimmy, did you get that done?" You know, Sue, remember remember we talked about this last week? It's 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 spot on. It's real time. Works great. So the burden of the burden of remembering goes away uh because of these ch check-in reports um that you get at the end of the day, as well as you get a much better sense of where you stand without having to interrupt the other person and for anyone that likes to dabble in the psychology of interruptions, every time you interrupt some uh, someone that's deep in, uh, deep in thought or deep in work, it takes twenty minutes for them to get back into that line of uh, you know line of thought, which means an interruption. You've got ten interruptions in a day. You basically have blown your work day. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. You know, we've got a a very talented group of individuals that that we work with and any this this you're, you're more right about it being a philosophy than it is just looking for increased productivity um this is more of using someone for what their best skill set is and so even if it seems something that's that's kind of minor taking that off their plate and knowing that someone's not just doing it, but doing it and tracking it and reporting on it. And then that report comes out at the end of the day, they could go and read it on the, on the bus ride home. They don't have to be sitting next to someone to get a, 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 an update on it. They don't have to make a phone call that you wouldn't normally make, but you have it all right in front of you. So if there is something that you, you forgot that day, well, one of our estimators or product managers, there's a reminder right there of it. And then it sparks something to say, oh, yeah, by the way, you know what? Let me shoot an email out quick. I forgot to get in touch with that that client or that subcontractor about this. It's it's all right there in a way that it, it wouldn't happen, actually, if it wasn't if it wasn't, de you know, detailed and documented at that level. What I what I heard is this is a better way of dealing with humans. <laughs> and all their positives and negatives um, than what we've traditionally seen in sort of the job site in the construction world. Um, and what I've also heard is that uh, there's plenty of room for improvement, but you've got something figured out just with dealing with the human aspect of you know, everything from errors and accidents to um, sort of wrapping it in a process in a way that's not too too hard for any one person to remember. 
Yeah, I, I, I go back to my story in the coffee shop where the guys just weren't bragging about how, if, you know, their their trucks being bigger or better, or their equipment being newer. Um, they really were benchmarking each other, you know, benchmarking against each other, where they were talking about different projects that they were working on. And there was some bravado, don't get me wrong, around how fast they got it done or what did, <laughs> you know, how much better this guy was than that guy or this new piece of equipment that they had. But they were doing the same thing. They were over a cup of coffee. They were saying, how, you know, how, how do we get this a little bit better? Um, <clears throat> it came out as I'm better than you, but there was a lesson in it. There was a lesson in, in how do we Im improve on what we're doing um, and, and, and how we're doing it. Now, don't get me wrong. None of my family or any of the guys that, that we were competing against would have ever said that. But the lesson that I learned as a kid was that's exactly what was going on. You know, if, if someone was buying a new piece of equipment and all of a sudden they found out that they were they did the job 10 or 20 percent faster, you better believe everyone's going to go buy the piece of equipment because they knew they couldn't keep up. And they, they, and they couldn't uh, um, be as efficient as they were uh, and then be able to apply that to, to different models throughout, uh, you know, throughout the area where there, you know, there's, there's always a great story that I love that my, my dad used to tell me is that. Uh, he worked for a guy and they did a job over in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, that's an island right off of Cape Cod. Not very easy to get to. And they just figured out how to make it work. And they figured out how to uh, <laughs> how to run this thing. And the, the story behind it was that they were part of what they were doing was running double shifts. And uh, Dave Walsh, the guy who owned the company, came up and he asked, uh, he asked my father, he said, you know, Roger, how, how did you get the guys to run double shifts? He said, I told them that if they weren't running the second shift, there's nothing else out here to do except hang out in the bars. So either one of them was going to end up uh, arrested or divorced. And so I said, guys, let's, let's just run the double shifts and, and we'll make sure that we all get home okay. <laughs> so, uh, I love that story. These, okay. these are stories. These are stories you just don't get unless you've lived it. Yeah. yeah we had, uh, had some fun times. Well, uh, have you been back to the coffee shop since uh, since Eastman Cook's been around? And have you been able to share the tales with uh, either your family or the, the construction companies that are there? Well, I certainly, I, I you know, I am the um, chief storyteller as well ah. uh, in, in my company. So I, I tell a lot of stories about my uh, my great uncle, John, who was, was one of my mentors. Um, I actually... Um, have his you know the old um dynamite exploders from like uh the bugs bunny show oh yeah oh, i actually yeah. have i actually have his because that was one of the things he did is that he would he would blast rock and um so it's kind of cool having a lot of these old antique tools and things like that um but the problem that happened or the situation that happened i should say is that dunkin donuts doesn't have a counter you can sit down at it anymore and <laughs> that's so true Back in that those days, you'd get a, a real mug of coffee and you'd yep. sit around and you would socialize with people. And the other part of it is that, that something happened along the way that you have to have blasting music to order a cup of coffee now. You it, you know, it has to be near <laughs> deafening, which it never would have worked back then because yeah. everyone was hard of hearing. And, and you know, all, all of my family, all of everyone who's there was around loud equipment all day. So they were all half hard of hearing. Um, and they never would have been able to order a cup of coffee. So the dynamic in Dunkin' Donuts changed. So now with, with my kids and, uh, you know, with my friends and things like that, we'll, we'll have to do it somewhere else. But we've, we've got our own versions of it. Got it. I, I was about to say, uh, anybody that's listening that's looking for a second endeavor, uh, perhaps making a old school coffee shop where it's more communal, uh, might be the the play uh, to have, yeah. and obviously not a twelve dollar cup of coffee uh, is going to be a, a key show component there. But you know, I'm not a pricing guy when it comes to you know retail. <laughs> <laughs> and they used to have these round seats you used to be able to yep. twirl around on. I don't know if you oh, yeah. remember those or not, but that was that was one of the the highlights of being a kid is seeing who could spin each other around as fast as they could. <laughs> Peter, you've implored a huge amount of wisdom on us uh totally appreciate uh you being on the show with us uh i think it's time for our last question that we like to ask on every show 
if you were to go back to 20 years, what would you tell yourself? What advice would you give? What would you tell your younger sir, self? Uh, I would tell myself to stick with it and keep persevering um, that what seems like a big challenge right now, you're going to look 20 years back and go, boy, was that easy to fix? And that really wasn't a big, a big deal. And I will tell you a quick story to reinforce that is that when I started out in the field, um, I was wet behind the ears and um, just a little bit of a punk kid who thought he knew everything about construction because I'd been in it for so long. And so I had, I was working under a superintendent out in the field and he, um, you know, he wanted to humble me a bit. We'll, we'll, we'll use that word. And he said, Peter, go over there and lay that out with the carpenter. And I had no idea what I was doing. Zero, like none whatsoever and fumbling and probably red in the face and, and thinking I was going to get fired. And he let me suffer there for for a good amount of time before he came over and he showed me what what it was and how to do it um and it was a great lesson and i will tell you if he asked me the same question today i'd knock it out of the park I'd, it's like it'd be no problem at all we do this do this do that and you know we, we you know we've got it all done and that's the that that would be like the 20 year look back something that i thought was a huge issue at the time that i could never figure out that i was going to get fired for now i look at it and i say really wasn't that big of a deal love that wisdom uh love the story too uh i know i've done that a few times so uh mm -hmm. putting someone uh, you know lighting the lighting the fire underneath their seat and seeing seeing how they deal with it uh yeah. when they're uh i'll use your term the punk kid that uh thinks they know everything <laughs> <laughs> um for sure justin why don't you close this, this out? Yep, absolutely. This has been awesome. We're going to throw all your social links and all that stuff in the show notes. Uh, but if somebody wanted to get a hold of you and East, uh, Eastman Cook, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, certainly go to our website, eastmancook.com. Um, I can be emailed at peter at eastmancook.com. Um, you can, you'll, you'll, if you look for us, you'll find us. Got it. No, <laughs> for sure. Um, and is there anything else you'd like to tell the people before we uh, say our goodbyes? No, keep on building, and this is this is uh, this is the way that uh, America has been great. It's been our foundation for uh, for the starts of the company, for the starts of our country, and um, we're going to keep doing it. And we're just going to keep doing a little bit better every day. One percent better every day. Love it. Um, well, listeners, we had a blast. I hope you enjoyed uh, this chief storyteller uh, and, and me and Will. Uh, and until next time, adios. Adios. Take care, guys. Thanks for listening to Building Scale. To help us reach even more people, please share this episode with a friend, a colleague, or on social media. Remember, the three pillars of scaling a business are people, process, and technology. And our mission is to help the AEC industry protect itself by making technology easy. So if you think your company's technology pillar could use some improvement, Book a call with us to see how we can help maximize your IT and cybersecurity strategy. Just go to buildingscale.net slash help. And until next time, keep, keep building, building scale. scale. <laughs>